Uh, hi, everyone. Oh. Hi. Um, my name is John Manning, and uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, the porting process for uh, Night in the Woods to iOS. Um, so, uh, first of all, just to set the stage, hello, everyone. Today's my birthday. I'm from Secret Lab. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm from Secret Lab. We're based down in Hobart, and uh, I've been working on Night in the Woods with the uh, core development team for about about a year and a half, two years now. Um, in addition to doing indie game stuff, I'm also an author for O'Reilly Media, so I've written a whole bunch of both non-game dev and game dev books, as well as the most recent one, which is a book about Unity. This is a shameless plug. Please go and buy my book. Um, I also have uh, made a few games for a, a, a few people. This is a game we made for the National Museum of Australia, uh, which is kind of like a board game type thing, which, uh, which was great. Is there a way we can turn down the lights a little bit, just to uh, remove some of the washout? Because um, that would be great, because we have a lot of contrast in these slides. Do I? Oh, presentation mode. <laughs> Incredible. Thank you. OK, well, that's better. Um, so yeah, so, uh, uh, some games, including some games for Qantas. We made a game for kids for them, which was nice. Um, and also uh, some of our own as well, like a game in, uh, involving a, a gnome being dropped in a well on a rope uh, with traps, a, uh, a game uh, based on the life and times of Leonardo da Vinci, which is also looking really good, and uh, also the one that you're all here to see, which is Night in the Woods. So, um, Night in the Woods was developed by uh, Infinite Fall and uh, published by Finji. Finji, of course, no, best known right now for, uh, for Overland, but also for other games like uh, uh, Tunic and uh, Counterbolt and stuff like that. Um, and we're announcing today that uh, Night in the Woods is coming to iOS. So, that's cool. And I've been working on this for a while, so this is nice. Um, so, today, just to outline what we're going to be talking about, um, I'll just for anyone who hasn't played Night in the Woods uh, or doesn't know much about it, I'm going to give you a quick like, tour of what the game actually is, just both to set the, the stage narratively and also to give you an idea of the kind of game and kind of technical challenge that Night in the Woods presents to a porter. Um, I'll talk about what our process is for bringing this game, which was originally designed for uh, much, much bigger machines, to very, very small machines, um, and tips on input and how to actually fit the game and its memory burden into a mobile device, how and why you should extend the crap out of the Unity editor, because that's the only way you can get this kind of stuff done, and if we have time, some Q&A. Okay, so, Night in the Woods. So Night in the Woods is about this cat. Her name is May. She is a college dropout who has just moved back uh, into her family home in the rundown town of Possum Springs. And she finds all of her friends have moved on with their lives, but she really has not. Um, so it is a game that's primarily about being stuck in bad life situations, while also being extremely colorful and cutesy, but also really, really quite depressing. Um, so, I must give a spoiler warning, um, I'm not going to be talking about the story hugely, uh, but it's very hard to avoid light spoilers. So, uh, that being said, this is a game that's been out for more than six months, so I feel like, like, I don't have complete, like, carte blanche to spoil everything, but I feel like I've got a little bit of leeway. So there might be some light, uh, sp story spoilers in this. So, the gameplay of Night in the Woods is, uh, primarily platforming talking to people and also doing uh, little mini-games. that like, We call them mini-games because that's what we call those kinds of breaks in a normal kind of interaction, but really they're not so much mini-games as a uh, moment in which we can deliver a, a different piece of story content, and this point has gone on too long, so I'm going to move on. So really, we divide the gameplay into four different things. We have the platformer, so running around, talking to people. We have some explicit mini-games, so we we'll actually say, okay, this is a new thing, we're changing the camera view. We also have some implicit mini-games, that is, we change the complete control scheme of the game to fit a moment without actually moving the camera around. So you're no longer running around Possum Springs, but you are still like doing something uh, from the same perspective. And finally, we have an embedded game called Demon Tower, which was a totally separate thing designed by a totally different team of people and just is embedded in the game as a game that May likes to play on a laptop. So the platforming, this is very, very, very standard stuff. Um, so we have run and jump, no new mechanics, um, there's no vaulting, there's no, this is not a, a, a fancy uh, skill-based platforming game, because really Night in the Woods is primarily an adventure game that pretends to be a platformer. Um, and yeah, it, right, we care more about the dialogue, honestly, than, than um, the moment-to-moment -moment platforming interaction. Um, although, don't tell the team that. Um, 
We have a whole bunch of mini games. Again, those air quotes. I don't like to think of them as mini games. Some scenes in the game only have dialogue. They progress the story. They aren't like cutscenes. They're just a different part of the game. Um, so they change the perspective completely. We take control away from the character, and the only thing you can do is progress the dialogue and make options in the branching dialogue there. So, for example, um, uh, there's a moment in the game where you just eat pizza, and so you get you get control over one of May's hands, and you can position her hand over the piece of pizza and grab it and pull it off screen and then we make some eating noises. Meanwhile, dialogue's happening and you can do stuff like you can grab somebody else's finished crust and eat that and then other characters will react to that and say, that's gross. Um, and so it's things like that. We give the player opportunities to just not be limited to a single uh, gameplay experience. So uh, we call this uh, specific kind of interaction which pops up multiple times in the game, pause mode. No? Oh. <laughs> so that's an example of, of what I'm calling an explicit minigame. That is, like, it's very clear this is not a platformer, this is something different, and, and, and the game is take, taking a bit of a break from the normal uh, gameplay. But we also have some implicit minigames. So the implicit minigames are things like um, we are viewing the game side on, and it's just like a platformer, but we change what the game uh, is doing in response to your inputs. So there's a moment in the game where May goes to a party and she is, uh, and she goes, okay, I'm just going to go dance. And so at that point, we actually take control away from the player. Um, you no longer run around, but now your input is mapped to the direction in which you're dancing. So we have a, a really, really wide variety of different controls happening in this game. Um, and the fourth and final uh, interaction that exists in the game is uh, Demon Tower. So this is an embedded roguelike. Um, it's the game within a game. It's a totally separate game and actually has uh, a fairly strong independent fan base, it turns out. Um, there's actually a separate speedrun community for Night in the Woods and for Demon Tower. Um, the current record right now, if you're interested, on, uh, as recorded on speedrun.com, is 10 minutes 5 seconds, as opposed to the rest of the game, which is at roughly two and a half hours, um, with the intended play length being somewhere around eight hours. Okay, so that's the background of what the game actually is. So we have a, a, a narrative-focused adventure game in the shell of a platformer with multiple different input styles, and already this is becoming a bit of a nightmare for a touchscreen port. So let's talk about the differences between the kinds of platforms. Some of this will already, already be familiar to you if you've ever uh, worked on or even just used a mobile device, but it's worth just recapping the, the key points as they apply to someone who's doing a port. So. For the purpose of this talk, the PC and the PS4, which are the two platforms the game was designed for, are basically the same thing. The main difference is that the PC is worse for input. Don't at me. Um, really, I'm going to be talking about the difference between iOS and real computers. Um, so these key differences between uh, mobile platforms and every other non-mobile platform. Now, the big one, the obvious one, is the touchscreen. Now, there's a few key, key things to remember here. Touchscreens cannot be felt, that is, individual areas cannot be felt on the touchscreen. Additionally, human hands are not see-through, and I'd like to insist they have never been see-through, no matter what you might have heard. So, because we have basically a blank canvas, every single uh, game has a different kind of uh, approach. There's, there's like common themes we see across different games, but you know, there's, there's no single set of controls that people can just fall back to, which is not the case for uh, the PS4 or even the PC. Everyone is familiar with WASD, but you know, where exactly do you uh, put, put your finger for the controls? Does the joystick reposition based on touch? Things like that. Additionally, because we're now working with screens that have controls that don't have a standard location, the controls must now be a minimum size in order to be usable. So we actually must make sure the controls are at least a centimeter by centimeter in size, otherwise the player won't be able to be, able, be, able to be precise enough to interact with them. They're also smaller in the case of phones as opposed to tablets, so that means that the text must be made much larger in order to be legible. And this affects your overall screen layout. Because already you're covering up the, the gameplay area with controls, now you must make the gameplay itself be bigger. Almost always your games are played on battery. Now this reduces the processing cap uh, capacity because you, know, you can't burn through the same kind of power that a plugged in device would have. But it also means that players will choose not to play your game if they think that it will consume too much battery. So, you, if you create a game that is quite performance intensive, then you're going to end up people, people going, eh, you know, I'm already on 50%, you know, and they're, they're going to choose not to want to play. Finally, as 
both a battery discharges and also as uh, the CPU uh, is used and the GPU, the device will get warm in their hands. People don't like feeling uncomfortable. And so if you're, if you're holding your phone and it's, it's really getting uncomfortably warm, then people will just say, okay, that's enough for now. So if your goal is to keep people engaged, then you have to remember this kind of thing. RAM. Um, RAM has actually gotten fairly good in recent devices, but again, these are mobile phones. So we have a variable range of RAM. Um, so on the iPhone 6 and also some older devices, uh, it can be as low as one gigabyte. Um, on the iPad Pro, it's four gigabytes. This memory is always shared with the GPU. Speaking of the GPU, um, iOS devices, considering what they are, have a really good GPU inside them. They're actually, like, the, especially um, Apple's most recent chip, the A11 GPU, uh, is really quite powerful. Um, however, because they have a tile-based deferred rendering architecture, this changes the way that you lay out your scenes and perform your rendering, and I'll come back to this in a bit. On a phone, you have limited storage space. Now, again, well, that's, that's one of those things you go, yeah, of course. But remember, it's their personal device, and you're competing against their photos. So if they have to make a choice between whether to keep your game installed or whether to delete their photos, which one do you think they're going to pick? Now, the PC version of Night in the Woods is roughly four gigabytes when installed. That's, that's a quarter of the size of the smallest, hard, uh, uh, the smallest device. So you have all kinds of constraints there. Again, we have a, a wide variety of uh, devices to run on. We have the iPad, which has a four by three aspect ratio. We have the iPhone, most modern iPhones, everything uh, older than the iPhone 4S has a 16 by nine aspect ratio. Everything before that has a three by two, but that's not really supported anymore. Um, and the iPhone 10 has roughly a 19.5 to nine aspect ratio. Um, I don't think anyone has, has like measured this properly yet. Um, now this matters quite a lot in a game where the camera position is authored. That is, the position of the camera in Night in the Woods is very precisely chosen. You know, we make sure that like only the things that the player needs to see is on screen. This is different to uh, games where the player has control over the camera, so they can you know, move their camera around, they can run to a different part of the level. Like, that's fine. You can handle different aspect ratios much more easily. But in this case, we had to do special stuff to make sure that we always constrain to a certain aspect ratio, because otherwise we have to reauthor every scene. So iOS is really two separate platforms operating under the same API because they're used in totally different ways. On the iPhone, we tend to see short bursts of gameplay. It's held in the player's hands, and also it's more popular than the other uh, interaction, which is, of course, the iPad. So the iPad has longer gameplay sessions. People will sit down and they'll go, okay, time to play a game. Whereas on the iPhone, they're standing at the bus stop and they're bored. You have five-ish minutes at most, maybe. So, or maybe they're in bed. And that's a whole other interaction as well, like they're lying and holding their, their, their device above their, above their face. So on the iPad, it's usually not handheld. Usually it's resting on some kind of surface because iPads are heavier than iPhones. People don't want to have to hold them the entire time. With that being said, they have very similar hardware, and we find that iPads are generally not that much more powerful than iPhones. They tend to have the same chipset. Uh, the iPad Pro is a big exception, uh, but uh, at the moment, like common iPads, so, so the, uh, the most recently released uh, non-Pro iPad, is about the same guts as the iPhone 7. Oh, 6 Plus or 7. Um, and also, there's one like, neglected sibling uh, in this, and that is tvOS on the Apple TV. It's actually really, really good. Just no one plays games on it. So, you know, consider doing it. Maybe Apple will go, hey, thank you. Um, although, you know, Apple bows down to nobody. All right. So iOS kind of has this reputation for being well-designed, for whatever definition of well-designed you care to subscribe to. Um, and for Apple's stuff in particular being opinionated. Um, now, that's shorthand for the developer has uh, picked a single way that it should work, and it's the best way. So that's opinionated software. And that kind of is expected by a lot of people to carry over into games as well. Now, I have some opinions on that because there's this trend in software to have a single correct approach, and the idea is that you put lots and lots of effort into, uh, lots and lots of thought into the way that you designed your software, and adding in too much complexity would compromise your, your design and overcomplicate your product. So the idea is software should be opinionated. It's a very common buzzword in software dev these days. Now, opinionated software is great if your audience already agrees with your opinion. Um, it will not work, especially in games 
well, uh, to be rigid in, uh, in your vision. Unless there's a single obvious and you know, unequivocal best way to do something, then you should not approach it, uh, your, your games in this way. Give people options. Give people the choice to change their input map, especially on a touchscreen device. Put in the effort that is now necessary for testing each configuration. Now, this is actually very, very ironic given that Night in the Woods is actually a game about people not having options, but I digress. Um, if we were going for the purest expression of what the game's story is about, I imagine that it would be uh, one, uh, a, a game in which there's only one way to do it and it's not actually that great, but that would make it not harder to sell. Uh, so, and this is actually the same reason why nobody swears in Night in the Woods, because we want to make sure that, that the game is as accessible to as many people as possible, and that includes age. So no one swears Night in the Woods um, in order to preserve a T for teen rating. Because um, otherwise, you know, there's no way that, uh, that a kid under the age of 15 would, would be, have a chance to play this, and we think that's important. So Night in the Woods is not a skill-based game. I mentioned that before briefly, um, at least most of the time. If your intent in the game is not mastery over some challenging skill, then you should make every single effort you can to make the game as easy and accessible as possible. So for example, this is a change that was made to the game uh, a few months after release, uh, at the very start of the game, um, it was considered very important that the player learn that you can jump and that you need to be able to explore. And that's actually a fairly important thing because players will encounter more characters and different parts of the game by running around and exploring Possum Springs. So it was felt very, very important that players uh, know that you can do stuff like triple jump because in, in uh, Night in the Woods, triple jumping will, uh, gives you a, a, a higher jump on the third bounce. So this part of the game here, uh, the, uh, the, the Sawmill Park, requires a player to perform a triple jump in order to proceed uh, in the game. And a lot of people got stuck here. So a lot of people just, uh, for whatever reason, uh, could not execute a triple jump and they felt frustrated. So, if, so after release, um, we added in some stuff that basically, if, if May uh, keeps like, standing there and looking, we like... As May stands under that uh, structure there, um, a little thought balloon appears, and, and so she can interact with that and, and like talk to herself, saying, "Oh, I know, I can do a, like a running jump." And so, basically, explaining the tutorial to the uh, to the player. And if the player keeps tapping that thing, then May will say, "Actually, you know what? I don't. I'm going to close my eyes and go for it." And then we fade to black, and we fade up, and, you, and you're at the destination. So we skip the whole thing because it isn't necessary to perform exploration jumps in the game. You don't have to run around and explore Possum Springs if you don't want to. So we figured, yeah, the player is going to see less of the game, but it's either that or they won't see any of the game. So again, accessibility, ease of use, even at the, uh, at the cost of your own content. Okay, let's talk about how we design for touch-based interfaces. So a game controller, and also to a lesser extent a PC's input, so that is keyboard and mouse, they tend to force a certain gripping position. We're very used to holding a, a console controller in our hands like this. You know, they're, they're designed to mold your, to, to bend your, your, your thumbs and fingers in the right way so that they have easy access to the controls. And the same is true for PC and mouse. You rest your hands in a certain way like that, if able. Now a touchscreen controller will do this as well, but of course there's more variability. Additionally, not every single part of the touchscreen control when held in two hands in landscape orientation is easy to reach. So this is unfortunately not well color graded and so in the middle, uh, uh, that circle there uh, labeled easy is much smaller than the uh, circle labeled stretch. So um, the, the middle area is stuff that it's very, very easy to reach. You know, holding a, holding a phone in your hands, I can very easily reach these parts of the screen. With a bit of a stretch, I can reach further, and it actually becomes physically painful um, to uh, extend my, my, my reach to the corners or into the middle of the screen. So additionally, when you're looking at your device, there is a certain area of main focus. So looking at the screen, you're looking at the middle of that, and your fingers, at least the, the easily reachable parts of your screen, are in the middle of the uh, visible focus. So this becomes a real problem because now you have this, uh, you have occlusion of the screen and also of the easily reachable controls from your fingers. Now, of course, this varies hugely based on both hardware and user. It varies between device families, between iPhone or iPad. It varies between different sizes of uh, devices, especially on the iPhones. It varies between people with differently sized hands and also people with differently abled hands as well. So that means you have to consider all of your fleshy parts both the fingers and the palms. 
because players can't actually see what's under their fingers. You can't see what you're tapping. But there are also consequences like, uh, as well, because it isn't just the fingertips that are opaque, it's everything. If you reach up to the top of the screen, now you're covering everything below it as well. So tapping anywhere near the top of the screen covers up everything below it as well. This, by the way, is the reason why in iOS on Safari, the web browser, um, the URL bar is at the very top of the screen, whereas the share button is at the bottom of the screen. Because when, you, when you're reaching up to, to tap the top bar, you're going away from your current content. It doesn't matter what's on there, you're, it's about to go away anyway. Whereas the share content, you wanna be seeing what you're about to share, so those controls are at the bottom of the screen, thus preserving visibility. Now, there's actually a really great game that uh, takes advantage of the physicality of uh, the human fingers as they relate to the input system of a touchscreen device, and that is Fingal by uh, Adrian de Jong. Uh, this is an incredible example of um, uh, physicality touch input. Basically, you slide your uh, squares around the screen in, in cooperation with another player, and it forces you and your partner's fingers to touch and slide past each other to solve the puzzle. And it creates this fantastic awkwardness um, so the developers have said that uh, it has both brought people together and sparked relationships and also broken them up as well. <laughs> Small screens, I mentioned this before, um, they require the font size to be larger. On phones, although less so on tablets, a device is usually going to be held closer to the player's face than, uh, than a desktop or a laptop monitor. So that's another component as well, because user focus, like eye strain, can, uh, can become a bit more of a problem for phone, device, phone devices. On a touch screen, we have increased reaction times, because players can't rest their fingertips on the device, like they can on a controller or on a keyboard, which means that a touch screen will take longer to, uh, to, to be responded on. You, both you have to travel the finger from where it's resting down to the screen, and then on top of that, touch screens typically have a slightly longer registration time as well, because the sensor is, is, is refreshing at a lower rate, because it has to basically sweep the entire thing rather than waiting for a single contact to close in the, in, in the case of uh, physical controls. This is a problem that uh, is referred to as a common task in games called uh, temporal pointing. So the idea, uh, the, the definition of a temporal pointing problem is it, you must provide a specific input at a specific location within a specific window of time. Now this is much, much easier on, uh, in any single case uh, when the user has some kind of time to prepare. So this is the reason why uh, infinite runners are great on mobile devices because they give you lots and lots of lead-in time and they give you time to prepare and travel your finger down and touch the glass. Uh, if you want to learn more about this, there's a really great paper called Modeling Error Rates in Temporal Pointing by uh, Lee byung and Antti uh, Ulus Verta. Um, Ulus Verta, by the way, is a really, really big uh, mobile HCI uh, researcher, so um, definitely check that out. Um, one of the common shortcuts for interaction on touchscreens is gestures, so swipes, pinches, rotations. Now, these require a complete reconfiguration of the hand. So you actually have to completely reposition all of your fingers uh, and, and perform the gesture, and that makes it very difficult to chain gestures together. So you can't use these in the same way as you would um, a, a, a sequence of button, uh, button combos. So if you've never read the, uh, the book Game Field by Swink, um, definitely go check that out. Touch screens feel very different for the exact same game than physical controls. Um, because we have no mediated input device the users are not looking at the controls and they can't feel the controls. So I mentioned before Demon Tower. Demon Tower has a very different uh, control scheme to the rest of the game. We haven't finalized the design for the input for Demon Tower yet and I would not be surprised if we uh, didn't go for a very retro visible on-screen joystick to match the, the, the retroness of the game. Um, although Adam has opinions about uh, game feel, so uh, especially for Twitchy games like this, so we'll see. Uh, the point is though that uh, your touch controls should be made to suit the context of the game as well as both uh, taking into account the, uh, the user's requirements. So we have multiple interactions in the game, uh, like I mentioned. We have platforming, we have dialogue, and, and we have mini games. I actually broke out every single item that you uh, do that changes away from uh, main platforming. So we have you know, platforming dialogue, but we also have every single one of these is a totally different interaction model. And we have to have controls for each of those. So the way that we do platforming is, um, it doesn't matter about precision, so we can just do side buttons to walk and also swiping up to jump around. Because we spend a lot of time interacting with people and objects, it's tap to interact. But also, if people don't want to be holding down their fingers on the glass to walk around, we also support tap to walk to point. 
um, which, is a, which is actually a game, a, a game control scheme that I see happen quite a lot in uh, first-person games that don't require speed. So the Talos principle uh, does this really well. Um, in dialogue, it's very, very straightforward, tapping to advance or to switch options or things like that. Um, one thing we noticed actually is that the dialogue balloons in Night in the Woods look very similar to the page control in iOS, which uses a use to swiping to navigate between, so we support that as well. So again, keeping in mind the fact that this is running on a specific platform helps us make the game better. Um, for the minigames, um, the most common kind of minigame is uh, what we call pause mode. So we implement this basically as a joystick control on the PS4 and direct manipulation on touchscreen. Um, and also we have a few very rare timing and dexterity minigames as well. So like the knife fight, uh, the crossbow shooting, uh, tossing pierogies into Greg's mouth. Um, and these are implemented as a combination of uh, invisible joysticks on screen and some directional buttons as well. Now, I've been focusing a lot on uh, touchscreen input, but I should uh, also mentioned that game controllers are absolutely a thing on iOS. The platform supports them. Um, there's a wide variety of models available for people to use. No one uses them, or at least like 1% of all people who have ever heard of games maybe have, uh, have used them. But it doesn't take that much effort to support them, so you should do that because the few people who do use it will love you for it. Now, there's some other stuff that isn't specific to being uh, a game. There's stuff that is stuff that you should do if you are on iOS at all. You should be a good app as well as being a good game. You should fit in to the iOS platform. So that means, for example, support iCloud. iCloud, of course, is their uh, user document syncing system. It's actually really quite simple. It, uh, you basically, uh, with this implement, you get free save game state syncing. Uh, you don't have to set up your own servers or run an account or manage anything like that. Just because the user is signed into iCloud in the first place gets you free data syncing. And so for the user, it just works, although you do have to handle edge cases like conflicts. Um, Replay Kit, it doesn't always fit your game, but it does exist. So it allows your player to record content and also broadcast as well. You sh should also respect the fact that the user is running your game on a single shared device. It's shared with other applications as well, and maybe they'll need to check their email later. So a great game that uh, respects the fact that it's running on a mobile computer rather than just a mobile gaming platform is Hearthstone, because Hearthstone at the lower corner of the screen shows the time and battery, which is awesome. Like, I, I rarely see this happen, but I love they did this. Um, don't be afraid to patch your game very often, because on iOS 7.1 and above, the App Store lets you send binary diffs of your updates. So you don't have to worry about slamming your user with multi-gigabyte uh, patches, even if your app is quite large. So, we had a real problem with Night in the Woods in that it is very, very performance intensive for reasons that are kind of hard to anticipate, and that is there's a lot of sprites in this game. We have uh, basically nothing in the game is vector-based, it's all bitmaps. And that's because the whole thing was done in After Effects and then rendered out to sprites. So even though it's got very flat shared of stuff, a lot of people assume that they were actually uh, models or, or vectors, but they're not, they're actually sprites. So keeping your draw calls low is always a good idea for any platform, any engine. Um, Unity will uh, batch objects automatically for you if the, uh, if the vertex count is over 900 uh, and they share common material and fit some other criteria, so check the documentation for details. Um, you can also uh, manually say these things should, uh, are static and therefore the, the batching system should kick in uh, a, a static process. Um, this is more efficient than dynamic batching. It does use more memory because it has to uh, create a copy of the group geometry. Um, alpha blending, quite bad on uh, mobile GPUs because of tile-based deferred rendering. So the reason for this is a, a energy saving mechanism. On a non-mobile device, um, basically everything that's sent to the GPU is rendered immediately. So if an object is rendered and then later on in the render process, another object is rendered in front of it, the pixels for the object in the rear, uh, that's wasted work. They, they should not have been drawn. Um, in tile-based deferred rendering, the rendering waits until all of the geometry has been submitted, and then the vertex shader gets run on all the geometry, the fragments are created, and the depth buffer is created all, all at once, rather than doing it piece by piece. At that point, so we aren't running any fragment shaders yet, but at this point, we, the fragments exist. Any fragment that fails the depth test is now discarded right away, and because we know that we have all the geometry, we know the depth buffer is complete. So that, this means that we don't have to run fragment shaders that, for pixels that will never be, uh, never be shown. So we uh, get very, very uh, little performance uh, uh, penalty because of overdraw. But if a fragment is being alpha blended or alpha tested or the shader contains the discard operation, 
then the GPU can't assume that the only way to, to check to see if a fragment should be discarded or not is in the depth buffer. So it then has to run, run the whole thing completely and uh, all the optimizations that existed for, um, for energy saving there get skipped. So just the mere presence of alpha blending or, or the discard operation can lead to more expensive rendering. So uh, particle systems are a huge offender for this. They can be super bad, especially if they're large and dense because they have huge amounts of alpha blend overdraw. So try and avoid those. Now, the original game kept a lot of stuff in memory and iOS can't do that. We actually can't fit all of Night in the Woods into memory. It's not possible. Um, so what we did was we developed a technique for uh, compressing the sprites in a form that is uh, complementary to the existing texture compression system. Um, and I'm gonna talk about that in a bit of detail. So sprite dicing is a technique that's been around for a little while. The idea is that you divide a sprite into pieces and you, then you discard the, the pieces that are transparent. Then you record where those pieces were and then pack the pieces back into an atlas. So. This is a technique that has some advantages and some disadvantages. The advantages, of course, are that you are discarding more pixels, so you don't have to use as much. You have more efficient atlas usage. Um, you also can uh, pack concave objects uh, within each other because now you're working with just a bunch of small squares rather than irregular polygons. Um, you can also save huge amounts of memory by doing this, and that's the main advantage of doing this. There are a number of disadvantages to doing it, though. So it requires a pre-processing pass. Now that can be quite time consuming based on the number of assets that you have. Um, additionally, the maximum size of a texture atlas is constrained uh, to 8192 on iOS uh, in both, uh, both dimensions. So you must have multiple atlases if you have a long image sequence and that can become more complex and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, because we're now working with uh, the, a rearrangement of existing pieces, we have an increased poly count for each sprite. This makes it more expensive to, to render, and also we have a higher memory burden for the meshes themselves. Um, when we're dealing with packed images and atlases, mip mapping can lead to bleeding between pieces as well. Finally, there's no built-in support for this in Unity, at least not right now, because in Unity, you can override the geometry of a sprite, but you can't override its UV coordinates. They're always generated from the coordinates you provide. That means you can provide, for example, a more tightly drawn outline around a sprite, but you can't override the texture coordinates that it's drawing from. Additionally, you must uh, manage uh, more assets uh, yourself. Now, I mentioned this is not a new technique. Um, so uh, the game Aladdin, um, which uh, was written about uh, only about a couple of weeks ago, um, because uh, uh, the source code was recovered, um, used a tool called Chopper. Now, Chopper, which was designed originally by uh, Andy Astor and improved upon by others, uh, it divided each frame into multiple tiles, removed any tile that was fully transparent, and then reassembled at runtime each frame. So um, I encountered this long after I'd written this tool, but it's nice to see that there's a bit of continuity of history. So the tool that I made for compressing this and saving space is called GrabThar's Hammer which produces significant savings. So grab those hammer, uh, we wrote it for Night in the Woods, it takes your images, it dices them up, it discards the transparent stuff, and then my, uh, the contribution that we do is uh, we identify duplicate chunks and merge them together. So the real problem here is, here's one of the sprites from Night in the Woods, it's one of uh, May running to the left. If a sprite is concave, it has a lot of transparent pixels that a simple trim cannot remove. So the green box around the outside here, the lighter area, um, is what we would get if we just trimmed it away. But the red interior darker area is transparent stuff that we can't access because it's within the trim box. So if we were to divide each sprite into tiny pieces, then we get access to that concave area. So here's what it looks like. In this case, uh, green is discarded, red is kept. And you can see that we have access to that concave area towards the left, uh, the, uh, the lower left, or uh, underneath her legs. Now, there is some unnecessary transparent area here as well because we're uh, constraining each piece to be 32 by 32 in this case, but if we trim those as well, then it just gets even closer. So now we're dealing with tiny pieces that we can pack much more efficiently. And so here is a packed sprite sheet that contains all the pieces for that image. Now, the original image was 720 by 720. This is 512 by 512, and there's space left over. So that's cool. We're saving a lot of, a lot of memory there. One of the downsides is that the meshes become more dense. So our mesh density becomes quite a bit uh, larger and additionally, each vertex is uh, about 18 bytes and that multiplies that quite a lot. But you know, not, not much more than the original uh, mem uh, mesh memory in the first place. 
Now we have some imperfect uh, removal because any transparent area that is smaller than the grid size is still inaccessible. Now we can improve on that by uh, making our grid finer, but that does mean that we increase our um, vertex count exponentially because you know we just basically it, it's another power of two. Um, and additionally, because we're packing this into an atlas and we have to add uh, margins around each piece, then it becomes more. Uh, it, 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 you get diminishing returns basically. So. Once we've divided up our pieces, we then perform a deduplication pass. So we have, in Night in the Woods, most of the sprites have a lot of flat color. So we already discard empty areas. Why don't we also merge the areas that are the same color? And we do. So we average all the pixels in a, in a piece to get the average color, and then we take the uh, difference between each pixel and that average, and then if the total difference is within the certain threshold, we consider that piece a flat color. So here's that same uh, sprite. Um, in this case, I've actually dropped the mesh density to 16 squared rather than 32, just to give it uh, an opportunity to find more completely flat areas. And in fact, 16 is what we're going to be looking at later on. So here we find like May's head is um, largely the same blue color. Um, likewise, the interior of her shirt, um, that border where her arm intrudes into the, uh, into the cells uh, cannot be considered a flat color, so we have to pack those. So that's one thing. So we have the ability to find flat areas of color and we can get significant savings from that. But we can go further than this. So we can find pieces that are near identical. So if we have things that have the same content, then we can consider them uh, the same thing and only store it once, which is great. Um, now, the wrong way to do this would be to, to do a pixel by pixel comparison. So you'd say, um, with some naive uh, duplication, do the, do the pieces have the same pixels? Now that doesn't work um, in most cases and especially not in Night in the Woods uh, because uh, there's actually a noise filter that's applied over the images just to add, add a bit of you know, richness to the, uh, to the images. So also human eyes are not looking for that level of detail. So simple equality is not good enough. Instead we use an algorithm called structural similarity. So structural similarity uh, allows you to uh, compute whether two images have the same shapes in them or not. So uh, two objects that have the same, um, uh, the, the, the exact same curves and lines and stuff uh, would equal one. So well, that's the image compared to an image would be one and two images that are completely uh, dissimilar are closer to zero. So what we do in this case for our deduplication is we check to see if two pieces uh, contain similar shapes and are the same general color um, and we consider them identical if that's the case. Now comparing every single piece against every other piece creates a combinatorial explosion. So it turns out that to compute the number of pairs is factorial. That's worse than exponential. Um, and so, it, yeah, it kind of grows like that, um, which gets really, really bad. If we had 50 pieces, we had to, to check each unique pair, not just, you know, accidentally checking A, B, and B, A. We actually only check the unique pairs. So for 50 pieces, that's 1,200 checks. For 100 pieces, it's 5,000 checks. For 200 pieces, it's 20,000 checks, and so on and so forth. It, it, it grows nastily. So, May's sprites are 72720. So we would get, divide that into 32, for example, that's 529 pieces, which is roughly 140,000 checks. But in her run loop, for just for running left, that's 20 images, so that becomes 74 million checks. And it just grows and grows and grows. So, there are ways we can reduce this headache. So we can, ask, uh, be, we can be a little bit more clever about it. We can say, uh, where will we find duplicates? Well, we'll find them probably near each other. It's unlikely that the far left will contain a chunk that's identical to something on the far right. Like, it could happen, but it's unlikely. So we only check nearby things. We can also um, check across time as well. If we're deduplicating multiple images, then we can say, OK, let's only check this point and the next frame, because in two frames' time, they're probably going to be you know, quite different. Now, you should only do this kind of optimization work if you find it necessary. I found that my original naive approach works quite well for testing very simple animations. You know, I can process a, a run animation in about five minutes. But May herself has roughly 3,000 sprites, and deduplicating all those uh, pieces would take about 37 years at 1,000 checks a second. <laughs> now, given that we've announced that the game is coming out in 2018, yeah. <laughs> so... Don't spend that engineering effort on optimization unless you know that you need it, because it's very easy to fall down the rabbit hole of, you know, just, I can make my tool even better. 
So we pack um, these atlases into, uh, we, we pack these pieces into, into atlases. Now they must be square because PVRTC compression requires a square texture. Now that can lead to wasted space. So here is an example of a packed um, atlas. And you can see on the right and the lower side, there is a huge amount of empty space. So what we can do is we can use multiple atlases. Rather than making a single large atlas that would have wasted space, create multiple, uh, multiple smaller atlases. A 2048 by 2048 image is four times the size of a 1024 by 1024. But that creates a new problem because now your pieces for a single sprite will be distributed across multiple textures and that can become annoying. Um, one approach could be uh, assign each piece to a different material, but that becomes annoying, especially to animate, because changing materials for, uh, for a variable number of, uh, of um, changing a variable number of materials for multiple meshes becomes, you know, it, it's fiddly. A better way is to use a texture array. So now uh, each mesh actually contains a, uh, it, it contains two pairs of UV coordinates. Um, so we, the, the first UV coordinate, of course, does the, the lookup into the texture, and the second pair encodes which index into the texture array to draw from. So we are able to uh, bring this slightly more powerful uh, approach to bear. So the entire process for compressing sprites for use in Night in the Woods on mobile is we take our sprites, we dice them up, we discard any empty uh, chunks, we merge flats and duplicates, we pack the remaining pieces into one or more atlases, we generate a single file which maps the sprite to its pieces, which we actually do using meshes, it's just collada output, and then we render using a mesh renderer, and that's it, that's how we do it. So because each character in Night in the Woods is actually composed of multiple separate sprite renderers, which we did because it allows you to animate different parts of the body independently, um, each sprite renderer must be replaced with a mesh renderer um, on its own, and also each animation clip that applies to those sprite renders also must be modified as well. So this, again, would be a nightmare, and that's why we had to write a whole bunch of tools to do that uh, properly for us. So I wrote tools that uh, find all animation clips that contain a curve that modify a sprite renderer and replace them with new ones for uh, working with, um, uh, with mesh renderers. So what does this look like? Well, and also like, what kind of savings do we get? So let's take a look at two examples, one that contains a lot of movement, so a lot of like dynamic movement, uh, so in this case, um, May running left. So here's May running to the left. This is the uh, sprite set that's used in the game. So when we compress this, so these 23 uh, 720 by 720 sprites, uh, they're all RGBA. We compress using PVRTC at four bits per pixel. Um, the original, if we were to trim them and compress them, um, we would get 2.68 megabytes. Now that's actually overly generous to this because um, uh, we are not able to do that with PVRTC, um, but yeah. So we actually get a, a, about a 50% 50, uh, 50 saving. So it looks like this here, the green areas are stuff that we are saving and the red areas are stuff that we're forced to keep. So in slow motion, it looks like that. You can see here like the, the interior area is, is being saved quite a lot. In cases where we have low movement, um, so in this case, this is actually May's bed as she goes to sleep. Um, so we actually get uh, an even more significant saving because we're able to save a lot more of uh, the stuff that never moves. So we actually get, get a, a roughly 80% saving, which is you know, enormous. So again, we're able to, like, that, that pillow on the left-hand side there never really changes, so we're able to only store it once. So this temporal compression saves us a lot. So that's cool. Um, Unity has a great API for extending the editor, um, so we wrote a number of tools for improving on that. Um, so like our sprite size and converter. Additionally, outside of Unity, because this is a mobile de uh, device uh, and a mobile platform, we're gonna be using uh, a lot of automation tools that exist for all apps, not just games. The one that I strongly recommend to you is called Fastlane. Uh, Fastlane is brilliant. It automates your interaction with the App Store. It also automates your build pipeline. So you can type a single command, it'll build the application, sign it, upload it to the App Store, and then to notify all your test flight uh, uh, beta testers all at once. So you can do a build every half hour and send you know, builds all the time without ever having to deal with iTunes Connect. It's so much nicer. Please use uh, Fastlane. You can find information about it at uh, fastlane.tools. So please check that out. Additionally, if you want to write your own tools that work in the same way as Fastlane, Spaceship is a Ruby API for working with the, uh, with the App Store. So um, You'll find that at spaceship.airforce. Um, it's extremely good for any kind of uh, CI workflow. A few more minor tips for working with tools in, in Unity. Use Helpbox all the time. Use this to explain what your tool is about to do. 
Um, most of my tools contain all kinds of checks at the front to say, I'm about to do this, it's going to be very hard to go back from this other than doing a git revert, so please just be aware of this. So using Helpbox will save you headaches. Additionally, the progress bar API is the only way that you can provide a cancel button for your long running operations. So use that. Finally, be nice to yourself. Write the kinds of tools you would want to have. Things like a button to reveal a generated file in the file browser, so Windows Explorer or Finder, will just make your life easier. You know, be kind to yourself. You are your own user. Save yourself time. Um, the Unity editor itself must also be babysat a little bit um, when writing these tools because you have to, because now you're making the editor do, uh, editor do more. So things like you have to manually unload any unused asset that you're uh, iterating over. If you're, so if you're loading, modifying, and then uh, saving that, you must manually unload any unused asset. Otherwise, your memory usage will suddenly spike and you'll end up crashing your computer. Um, always pair start asset editing with stop asset editing, otherwise Unity just gets strange. Um, and also use the cache server if you don't like waiting days to reimport all of the uh, tens of thousands of sprites that exist in Night in the Woods. I've done that five times now. Um, so, on iOS we have a massively different playing context. We have a lot of constraints to deal with and overcome, but you do get to be on a phone and that's pretty cool. Um, we have a number of problems uh, that we had to find solutions for. So the lack of controller support means we have to create an interface that gives people multiple ways to interact with the game and express their intentions. We have the problem of short gameplay sessions, so we design for immediate save and restore. We have limited memory, so we, write, we wrote that whole system for our, uh, compressing our sprites. And also we have a lot of assets, so we wrote tools for batch uh, processing them. So with all that, um, thank you all so much for coming. I hope you learned something. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for maybe two questions. So uh, if you have them, then raise your hands. Yeah. Uh, so the question was, uh, do we use PVRTC or ASTC? So uh, right now we're using PVRTC because it's more, it's more available. ASTC is better, uh, but available on fewer devices. There's actually no way to limit your application to only run on an A8 chip, which is the point at which um, uh, iOS GPUs began to support ASTC. So you can't say to the App Store, um, only run on A8 chips and above. You have to support the A7. Um, at least you have to tell the App Store that um, it'll run on, 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 on A7. I have seen other uh, games uh, manually say, please don't run this or anything lower than an iPad Air 2. And it's not ideal. Um, you know, some games have to deal with that. Um, so yeah, right now we're using uh, PVRTC and there's a number of things we ha then have to do as a result of that. I'd love to be using only ASTC, but you know, we get what we take, take, take what we get. We'll be looking at making a release of that uh, in the coming year, more than that I can't talk about. Cool. Yes. At the moment, I have the game running in 700 megabytes down from 4 gig. Um, now, that means, so uh, that's almost the point where it'll run on a 1 gigabyte device um, because you can only use 66% of uh, the built in RAM before the, uh, the OS will kill you. Um, so, yeah. Um, and with further work, like, there's a lot more that I can do with this to, uh, to bring it down even further, and that means it'll run quite smoothly on the lowest memory devices. Cool. Sorry, I thought I saw. If that's it, then thank you again all for coming.